Hi everyone, welcome back to the Lighthouse. We're almost ready to go out into the development constellation where we're going to discuss questions and we're going to have an input talk today by Jayadi Ghosh, who I'm personally very much looking forward to see, especially after I missed her last input talk uh, at the YSI regional convening in Vietnam because I was stuck in traffic. So hopefully I'll make up for it today. I'm looking very much forward to see all the questions that's going to get out of it. Uh, as you know, uh, the questions fair is a new format where uh, we are not just going to hear a talk. At the same time, we're going to use this talk to get input into a list of questions that will be research questions for YSI in the future. So before we beam out in the constellation, here's a little video to explain how that works. First, go to ysiplenary.org and click the night sky. This is the questions fair, where each star is a question, and each group of stars, or constellation, contains questions within a particular topic. You can find questions fair sessions in the schedule in the left sidebar and join them from there. Just enter the session and join the Zoom. As you listen to the speaker motivate their questions, think about which questions you believe to be pertinent for YSI. While the speaker talks, suggest your questions to your peers by entering them into the panel. This is not a Q&A. The questions are suggestions for research in YSI, not a question for the speaker to answer. Take a look at all the questions that were suggested and like the ones that you think are best. The questions moderator will select the most liked questions and present them to the speaker for a comment. These questions will be added to the constellation, where they can be further refined. Refine the questions by finding the best exact phrasing. Suggest a rephrasing yourself, or like the rephrasings that you think are good. After the session is over, you can find the submitted questions in the constellations. As a plenary participant, you can mark your 10 favorite questions in the graph. Just click the star in the corner of the questions card and they will be added to your YSI profile. The most popular questions will make it into the final list. Okay, so we're almost ready to go out into the constellation. Before that, I want to make an announcement that after Jayadi Ghosh's talk, which will be interesting, please hang on because we have a super interesting and, and super exciting news that we received a letter from the Vatican and the Pope wants to take part in our questions fair. He has submitted questions and we're going to look at them after Jayadi Ghosh's talk. So when it's over, don't leave the stream. Come back and see how that's going to play out. Now, if you're watching from anywhere, uh, if you're watching from YouTube, from Facebook Live, make your way over to the YSI Plenary page, ysiplenary.org. If you're on the mainstream, make your way into the constellation, go into the development constellation. That's where you can suggest your questions. That's where you can take part in the questions fair and like the questions you want. Nurlan, who's our questions moderator, is going to explain all of that. So let's just get out there. Let's beam out into the development constellation. Development, development. It's up for new developments. But in the room's an elephant. Do we need new development or should we say to hell with it? Economies develop blossom and expand. The nations in development copy those advanced. Advancement into what? How to understand if your manufactured goods are good goods or bad. Development implies undergoing change of state in the body or in general, or within the nation state. The body may develop into really great shape. It also may develop into being debilitated by disease. See if our economy's advancement is subject to growth, then when's the growth of cancer? And how you know which is it, can you tell before or after? I don't really know, that's for economists to answer. Development, development. Get set for new developments. But in the room's an elephant. Do we need new development or should we say to hell with it? So, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Today, it will be a 
thrilling moment for all of us to to be a part of the question question fair with Jaya de Gauche. And I will just introduce you the question fair session from the question moderator point of view. I'm Norlan Jahangirli and I'll be moderating the question discussion part. So we are here to develop new questions and support other people while developing this. The, these questions will be our future research questions, not only for YSI, but also the larger community of economists that are involved or that are in contact with the YSI. Uh, in the graph, you will see the questions already submitted by the speaker that she will be discussing during the talk. Please feel free to suggest and like additional questions as uh, Jayade Ghosh speaks. The most liked uh, of those questions will be presented to Jayade for comments or some further elaboration. We will return to, uh, re return to them for rephrasing after the end of uh, her speech. And after the session ends, after she, she will finalize her speech and elaboration of different questions that we will raise or develop, um, we will uh, the questions we will start rephrasing have the chance to become one of the 100 favorite questions of the YSI Plenary 2020. Now I hand, hand it over to Surbi to introduce uh, Jayade Ghosh. Please welcome. Thanks a lot, Norlan. We're speaking to you from the Development Constellation and the purpose of our session in the Question Fair is to give the YSI community input to converging on 100 pertinent questions. I'm Surbi Kesa, coordinator of the Economic Development Working Group of the Young Scholars Initiative. And to set the stage and raise some pertinent questions, we would start with our speaker for today. And for that, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome our speaker for the Question uh, Fair. Hello and welcome to Professor Jayati Ghosh. We are excited to have you here. Professor Ghosh taught economics at Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi, and starting January 2020, she'll be the professor of economics at University of Massachusetts at Amherst. She's co-authored and edited 19 books uh, and nearly 200 scholarly articles. And of course, her work is really amazing. And it's my personal suggestion. I'm sure everybody knows about it, but personal suggestion to go and critically think and rethink all the amazing work that she has uh, done. She has received several national and international prizes, including the, from the International Labor Organization's Decent Work Research Prize for 2010. She has advised governments in India and in other countries. She's the Executive Secretary of International Development Economic Associates and International De uh, Network of Heterodox Development Economists. She has consulted for, she's, she's consulted for international organizations, including the ILO, UNDP, UNTAD, UNDSA, UNRISD, and UN Women, and is a member of several international commissions. She writes regularly for popular media like newspapers, journals, and blogs. And for me, as well as for several inspiring economists, she is definitely a big inspiration and strength. So welcome, Professor Ghosh. The stage is all yours to provide us your inputs on some of the most pertinent questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Surabhi. It's a great pleasure to be with you. And, you know, I have to say, I'm so impressed with this entire conference that all of you are organizing and also with the questions fair. I think it's very imaginatively done. I loved the wrap on development. That's terrific. And uh, I actually attended some of the earlier sessions, uh, which I think, um, I think you're on to a really good thing. So uh, congratulations so, on what you've been doing so far. And I'm really happy to be a part and contribute to it. I think I've already submitted three questions that I was asked to a while ago, but I've been thinking about it and I'm going to cheat and add another one. Because I, uh, uh, thinking about it now, I realize that I left out possibly what I think is the most important question. And in a way, it was already touched on by the rap that was just mentioned. And that's really the question of how do we understand and quantify economic progress? And at one level, this is absolutely fundamental, but another level of failure to deal with that is actually the basis of a lot of other analytical, conceptual confusions that we're making all the time about notions of what constitutes welfare, what constitutes productivity, and so on. So let me elaborate. Let me just explain this. Uh, we know that there are lots of problems with the measure of progress in GDP. 
We know that GDP is a very poor indicator of human welfare. There have been commissions after commissions, some really excellent ones, like the Sen Stiglitz V2C Commission and so on, that have gone into detail about what GDP does not do, the things that it wrongly adds to notions of progress and welfare, and what could be alternative measures. There have been attempts like, well, the human development indicator, of course, but you know, also the gross happiness index, the happy planet index, and people have come up with different things. Somehow, none of them takes off, right? Still, GDP is dominant. Everywhere, we are still using GDP per capita, GDP in purchasing power parity terms, which is an even more terrible concept, uh, which I don't have time to go into now, but definitely that's another real disaster. Uh, everyone still uses it, and all of us end up using it as well. When we Even now, today, when we're looking at the pandemic and the implications, we say GDP has fallen by so much in this country and that much in this other country and so on. It's, it's a problem for many reasons, but what I want to highlight now is, in a sense, the, the analytical problem with it. It actually raises both conceptual and empirical minefields, okay? We know that GDP measures are very difficult and complicated when you have large informal sectors because you're guessing. Every country that has a large informal sector, when it produces GDP estimates, is guessing. It's saying, well, you know, approximately this ratio of formal to informal. And we did a survey seven years ago and we found it was this kind of level. So that's what we're going to assume. This is really how countries do it. Okay. Uh, but that's, if you like, the, at one level, the more trivial, just just measurement problem. Think of the other fundamental conceptual problem, which is that a large part of economic output is uh, essentially increasingly now in the developed world and including in the developing world, is in areas and in sectors of economic activity which depend entirely on asset values and prices. Think of finance, for example. Returns to finance depend hugely on asset values which I don't have to tell you, vary significantly with the volatility of the market and, and so on. A significant part depends on the creation of uh, you know, markets in areas that earlier did not have markets or in the substitution of private activity uh, for what could be publicly provided activity. A universal healthcare system that is reasonably good and competent and provides a reasonable level of health. Let's say in Italy, a universal publicly provided system of healthcare is creates much less GDP than the completely dysfunctional, very expensive, exclusionary healthcare system of the United States, where you have a very expensive and over bloated private insurance system catering to some highly differentiated, well paid medical uh, providers, and a lot of exclusion. So you can think of other examples of a polluted, congested, uh, environmentally disastrous, privatized system of urban transport, like we have in most cities in the world today, and especially in developing countries. Most of our developing country cities are full of this privatized transport. That creates a lot more GDP than a clean, green, publicly provided efficient system of transport that everybody would have access to. So clearly GDP is measuring something wrong there. That there's a real problem with uh, how we are measuring progress. And so a lot of GDP expansion may or may not delineate progress. Unfortunately, despite all these commissions, we've not been able to find something else that will actually capture this. Uh, but and we, what we need is not something that gives you many indicators. I think that's a problem with all of the others. But, you know, uh, well, some of the others, for sure. The Sen uh, Stiglitz P2C uh, attempt was to provide 17 indicators, I think. That doesn't work. It's not going to happen. We know reality is multidimensional. But let's think of a, a few, you know, critical indicators that actually capture something meaningful. At one point, I suggested the basic living standards basic, uh, of the bottom half of the population as one option. But, you know, there are many different things we can think of. But there's another huge conceptual problem, and that has to do with something that you've been discussing in another, uh, is it constellation? That's about technological change, innovation, and so on. The notion of productivity. How do we capture aggregate labor productivity? GDP per worker, right? That's how you compare societies. You say GDP per worker. 
there's a huge problem with the numerator. We, I, I've already mentioned that. It could just be that you know the financial sector is exploding and you're getting big increase in GDP, but what does that tell you, right? But what about the worker part, the, the denominator? We typically undercount employment because we don't calculate unpaid labor. In India, to give you another example, the uh, official employment participation of women, the workforce participation of women is now as low as 14%. Ridiculous, obscene, very low. If you count, uh, as the labor force service allows us to do, if you count the women who are engaged in paid and unpaid, in unpaid care and other activities within the home, that is to say, looking after people in the house, processing uh, food and other items, collecting uh, fuel wood, collecting uh, water, kitchen gardening, poultry farming, doing all of those activities, you get 84% of the women working. So we're undercounting the workers, right? Uh, what are we doing? What does it mean, this GDP per worker then, for a country like India? When we celebrate the fact that our aggregate productivity is rising, how much of the GDP rise is due to uh, fictitious sectors like finance and so on, how much of the employment part, the worker part, is undercounted because we're not counting unpaid workers. So really there's a problem, and the more we rely, in a sense, lazily on this GDP per worker productivity measure, we are not understanding the real nature of technological change, of innovation, or of progress, and we are not able even to identify the actual areas in which we need to focus our policy interventions. So I'm sorry, this was a cheat. I brought in a whole new question, but I do think it's absolutely fundamental. Now let me quickly address uh, the other questions that uh, I had mentioned earlier. And these are also, I believe, hugely important. Uh, one of them is, I again would argue, broadly conceptual, like this, the GDP and progress question. And the other two are more, if you like, policy and interventionist and uh, minded. So one of the questions that I had earlier raised is about addressing the issues of intersecting inequalities. I'm sure all of you know all about that now, right? It's not just that there are problems of inequalities by class, but there's gender, there's race, there's in India caste, there's ethnicity, there's the local versus migrant, there's the you know, urban versus rural. There are all kinds of different ways in which inequality uh, gets expressed. How do we theorize this? And when I talk about theorizing this, I want to lay bare one thing which I believe economics has been relatively lacking in. We have been pretty good on distributional inequality. That is to say, more and more economists have, fo have focused on it, talked about it. The early political economists all talked about distributive inequalities. So we talk about how things are distributed, right? But we do not talk about relational inequalities, the difference in relations between people, between categories like the kind of the kind that I had mentioned earlier. And that is crucial. Why? Because that's what tells you about power imbalances. You cannot talk about gender inequalities by saying, you know, girls get this, boys get that, or men do this and women do that, because there's a relational inequality over there. There's a question of relative power. Sometimes it is directly power of one person uh, against another, but sometimes it's the power to influence policies in a particular way. It's the greater voice you have in politics and society and so on. How do we incorporate power imbalances uh, and relational inequality? in economic modeling and in empirical analysis. Economics has really shied away from this because it's tough, it's not easy. But I don't believe we can understand anything really. We cannot even understand the distributional inequalities until we address the power imbalances. And by addressing, I don't mean you solve it, but I'm saying you, you bring it into the analysis, you bring it into the modeling, you bring it in to your assessment of how a particular economic process plays out. And again, it's a tough call. But if you don't do that, if all of you who have already displayed so much imagination and thoughtfulness, and so on, if you don't take it on, then you know we will be stuck again going down that dead end. And I, th I think obviously you people can take it on. You're already thinking along the lines in which this can be done. On to some more of the, shall we say, more directly policy relevant kinds of questions. 
one of the big ones I would argue today in the developing world is the recognition of climate change and the argument that, you know, um, you cannot address climate change in the same way that you would in the North because you have huge absolute poverty, you have lack of development, you have people who do not have basic needs. And so there's a conflict, there's a trade-off. Either you can give growth and development, as is often called, and better material indicators to your population and particularly the poor, or you can go about uh, you know, mitigating climate change and, and so on and so forth. And so it's often presented as a conflict. Now, I personally don't believe that there is, but I don't think there's enough research about this. I don't think people are actually showing examples of where there is or is not on the conditions under which there is a trade-off, the conditions under which you can actually get a win-win, uh, what you would need to do to get a win-win. There is a talk of green growth. That, uh, certainly in the developed world, there's a lot more discussion of how you can do green growth. In the developing countries, very little. And again, we're stuck, to go back to the first question, with growth, with GDP as the, the, the trade-off is seen as between GDP versus uh, green, if you like. Whereas if you made the trade-off something about living standards of, let us say, the bottom 50% versus controlling and mitigating the environmental change and, and also adapting to it, you may, may, may find less of a trade-off altogether. But I think this is an area where especially in development, we have not put sufficient stress and we have to take it head on because policymakers always throw this back at you. Oh, it's fine for Sweden to do it. We can't afford to do it here. We have to have you know, more coal or more something or the other simply because we want to electrify all our villages. That kind of argument you will, you will have known about. Okay, and finally, taking on the power imbalance issue and now looking at the global architecture, this is something that I have actually thought a lot about over the years. Um, we all know it's an unequal global architecture. We also know that the uh, international, um, if you like, that imperialism, which uh, let me explain what I mean by imperialism, because people say different things when they mean different things and they say it. For me, imperialism is the struggle of large capital over economic territory. And what is economic territory? It can be anything. It can be markets, it can be land, it can be labor. It can be new commodities that suddenly have emerged, like intellectual property. Uh, it can, in, basically, economic territory is anything that enables profits for capital. And the struggle of large capital in particular, typically based in advanced economies, but not only based in advanced economies, that struggle expressed to me, the way it expresses itself is what I will call imperialism. I believe that imperialism in the late 20th century expressed itself in the form of legal rules, in the form of codes, uh, an international architecture that created a whole structure for both for trade and finance that made it very, very hard for developing countries to break out of it. We also know that that international architecture is <laughs> has been blown up in a way partly by the Trump administration, but also by all kinds of other things. And the pandemic is also doing all kinds of changes to that. But the underlying power structure, the underlying imbalance of power, the relational power that exists between developed, developing large capital and others, that still exists. And that creates massive pushback to equitable and sustainable development. To give you just one example, the sustainable development goals, which, you know, of course, everybody believes in. It's one of those motherhood and apple pie things that, because it's impossible to disagree with those goals. They're, they're all wonderful. They are harder and harder to achieve because the very way in which the UN that is tasked to do the so-called, you know, organizing the implementation has to shift to relying on the power imbalances. It has to say, well, let's get the private sector involved. Let's do public-private partnerships where we will, governments underwrite the risk and the private fellows take the profits because that's the only way we can achieve it. Let's think of new financial innovations, which are nothing but transferring the risk again onto citizenry to finance the required investments to, do, to meet the sustainable development goals. It hasn't worked in the past. It will not work now. But basically, why is this happening? Because of these power imbalances. So what we need to do, I believe, is also think about 
what are the changes in the global economic architecture that would at least enable a slightly less unbalanced power equation? Uh, I'm not even saying an overthrow because we have to move step by step, right? But what do we need in terms of the elements of an economic architecture that would actually allow for less of the blatant imperialism that characterizes the current one? Okay, let me stop here. I'm sure that uh, you will have many other issues and questions to take up. Okay. Thanks a lot for that intellectually stimulating and thought-provoking questions. That's really made me think uh, a lot. Before we go into the questions, I think I just have one thing to say and probably, uh, you know, raise or rather put another question to you based on what uh, you said. So, you know, the entire talk uh, makes me think a lot about this issue of power, which is kind of central to almost all the aspects that you raised, you know, how despite these contested and politically motivated understandings or definitions of even development and progress, these ideas are seemingly made to appear as value neutral or objective or, you know, as if progress is only good because it's defined in, or it's, you know, that's, that's the power of the discourse or so how it kind of gets shaped. And even with the issue of inequality, where we're recentering the issue of power in our analysis and assessments, and with uh, when we're talking about trade-offs and how we might be focusing on some sort of false opposites because we don't even want to see a third and you know, sort of element which might be central to the whole thing. But from that, I want to just link to the last point that you raised about this issue of imperialism. I wonder that with some sort of, of course, not absolute, but a relative convergence happening in the worker standards in different parts of the world to some extent, and also a higher precarity in global north as well as in global south, can we also shift towards looking at power as something between different classes, while of course being aware of the specificities of global north versus the south, but can we rethink in terms of introducing uh, you know, a class specificity in the power relations as well. Thank you. Yes, yes. Um, terrific question. Should I respond now or? Uh, yeah, I mean, if you, yeah, 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 sure. So, you know, what you're saying is absolutely correct and thoughtful. The power of the discourse, you're so correct. Yes, and um, we've seen it over and over again. But, you know, I think the power of the discourse is something that doesn't change on its own. It requires a lot of chipping away. I think what's happening at YSI is one of the ways of chipping away at it. I think the fact that thanks to technology, you are able to involve more and more people around the world to actually get into that kind of uh, discussion, I think that chips away at it. And over time, you can actually manage a change in the discourse. Not necessarily gradual. Sometimes it also happens like that, bam, because everything else collapses. So I would be much more optimistic about the discourse simply because of institutions like, like the one you're creating and, and people like you who are actually putting it out there and telling it like it is. The class is absolutely true. I'm sorry if I felt that I, I mean, if it seemed like I was underplaying it, because I don't. I think, I mean, most of my life I have seen class as the fundamental contradiction. But, you know, as I get older, I realize that it's, it's too complicated. That, yes, class remains a deep fundamental distinction, and it permeates all the others. Uh, but especially people like me who grew up in a certain kind of political economy tradition, we tended to underplay the others. And uh, that meant not only that we lacked political traction and we are continuously surprised at how we lack the traction, but also that we didn't do the analysis properly. Because, you know, relational power is very complex. Relational power, let's say the gender dimension. Uh, it, uh, patriarchy predates capitalism, obviously, but patriarchy also interacts with capitalism in very complex ways, in particular circumstances, which reinforce certain class equations, as, as you have done in your work on informal work, labor. You, you've kind of shown that as well, right? So I think the class dimension is absolutely crucial, but because it is also very context specific, it can be misused by, if you like, the other side, <laughs> the darker forces can use it, as is being done in the United States, where we see the working class almost overwhelmingly behind rather right-wing xenophobic and aggressively so forces. 
uh, and in parts of, of our own country, India, where you find similar, you know, a tendency of the class alignments to be much more oriented to becoming influenced by, you know, religious or national, so-called nationalist kinds of thing. And so I think focusing on, I mean, recognizing class is very different from focusing solely on class. What I find uh, very, uh, very attractive about what a lot of you are doing is that you are able to kind of combine all of those. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot for those answers and definitely makes me think a lot more innovatively about these uh, questions. So thank you. So now maybe we can move to the questions that were submitted to us by our audience in the constellation. And uh, let me remind all the, uh, the audience that we are in the constellation and the young scholars have been submitting us questions and we would like to reflect upon the relevance of certain of these questions for future research projects. So I will relay some of the questions uh, to Professor Ghosh and uh, you know, request her for her thoughts on the relevance of these questions and why they are important. So the first question that we have is, how can we build a model of development that encompasses the role of socio-cultural diversity, which is often ignored by the current model of development? So thank you. Yeah, this is a very excellent and brilliant question. Because, um, you know, it's so hard. It's so hard to actually do that. It's also difficult for many of us who are, are concerned about relational inequalities to uh, accept that certain cultures and certain societies require that, require relational inequality. I mean, gender is the most obvious example, but it's not only gender. And so can we impose an absolutist requirement? Can we say, you know, women must be allowed full freedom, autonomy, equality, mobility, blah, blah, the works, in a context where the culture, the weight of the culture is in the opposite direction? I don't have a simple answer to that. I think what we as economists can do, and remember, social scientists, we should always be modest, right? And that's, uh, economists are the least modest of the social scientists, and it shows in the quality of the work, unfortunately. But we have to be modest in terms of our um, ability to understand and our ability to prescribe. So it's, th this is a very tough one. I, I, I do not think I have, I think, in my own case, I, I believe that the answer is always really on a case-by-case -case basis. Will I uh, condemn a practice of burning a wife at the altar of the husband when he dies? Yes, I condemn it. It's a, okay. To me, that is murder, and uh, you know, it doesn't matter if there's a long cultural tradition in favor of it. Uh, will I similarly condemn something which is less extreme? Or will I argue that the, you know, the weight of the logic of that particular thing is so strong that it um, must be allowed to happen or that it must be unilaterally destroyed? That's very difficult. When we analyze economies, we must always be aware of that sociocultural context. I think that's where we have to be modest. We have to always be aware of that diversity and we shouldn't imagine that a particular community in a rural, uh, rural Scandinavia even is the same as a rural community in Kenya or in you know any other part of the world. So I think yes, that that's a very very significant important question. I don't have answers, but it's a good question. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for your reflection on that question. Um, also makes me think a little more about, you know, uh, the kind of modernities that we envisage itself have so many of these specificities and dimensions that you talk about, which even coming from a, you know, decolonial and global south perspective, we can then question that what is this alternate universal modernity or modern institution, so to say. So uh, thank you for that. Um, I'll, I'll now go to question two, uh, which uh, one of our young scholars says, is mesoeconomics an alternative to incorporate power imbalances and structural inequalities in economic theory? Oh boy. Okay, first I have to admit to ignorance. <laughs> is is mesoeconomics a separate stream or is it simply about dealing between the micro and the macro, the meso level? 
I presume it's if it's the latter, I can answer it. If it's a separate whole new thing, then I'm sorry, I'm ignorant. <laughs> yes, the latter. It's okay. It's, basically, it's uh, the it's the it's the intermediate. So listen, I mean, I would say that um, it's that's about levels. So you can take a, sort of an approach, an analytical framework, and apply it to different levels. The level is not the solution. The level doesn't give you the framework. You have to take your framework and approach it. Uh, approach that level with that framework. Yeah. So I would I would say that it's the other way around, really, the causation. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, thanks a lot for that response. So I'll now move on to the next one, which says low carbon green and circular economy approaches suggest localization of production of supply chains and of innovation. How can developing countries benefit from this approach if the West pushed for their fast integration into the world trade and global financial structures, which often run at the expense of local and endogenous development capabilities? Yes, absolutely. And in fact, that's, that was in a sense, you know, coming that the third question that I mentioned about how do we make a global architecture that enables these different kinds of innovation and alternative ways of producing, consuming, distributing, and so on. It's very, uh, it requires much greater levels of policy autonomy uh, at macro and meso levels, in fact, uh, uh, so that, you, you know, you can't, for example, uh, take the global supply chain in agriculture, which frankly sucks, right? It's really bad. We have really organized agriculture and food systems in the worst possible way, environmentally, on health grounds, in every possible way. So we are opening ourselves up, not just to zoonotic diseases, but to a complete plunder of nature and to all kinds of other health implications, which we are you know, not even aware of because of the preservatives and additives in food, because of the implications of GM that we haven't fully understood, and because of the unnecessary uh, storage and transportation of a whole range of goods, which needn't be, okay? You don't have to have strawberries all year round, nor does everybody in the world have to eat a particular food item that everyone else in the world is also eating and so on. So there's a, the food systems in particular is a classic example of this, of, of how you get more, you would benefit on, in all kinds of ways, economically, health-wise, carbon-wise, from a more local-oriented uh, system and a more sustainable system. But you can't do that as long as the global uh, trade pattern is one that is more or less forcing you into these production chains and telling you that's the only source of your employment, that's going to give you value added. You better sign a trade deal with the US because then your fish will be able to enter the US market. That's what is happening. So you really need a global architecture that doesn't force countries into this. And then within countries, states, provinces, communities into this, that enables innovation, which doesn't mean that you ban it, but that you de-incentivize it. At the moment, the incentives are all in the opposite direction. We have to actually bring the incentives back into promoting more local and sustainable forms. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot uh, for that question, uh, for that uh, response and reflection on that question as well. We are accumulating more and more interesting questions and our constellation is growing. So we are very happy about that. So uh, the next question that we have is, um, are there tensions between socially sustainable and an environmentally sustainable development model? Is the same problem applicable to developed as well as developing countries? It's so hard to see what is socially sustainable. You know, this is the other problem uh, because demands for greater e equality are often socially unsustainable because there's pushback. You know, uh, demands for greater empowerment of women, there's a patriarchal pushback. Demands of oppressed peoples, ethnic groups, castes, races for, you know, more justice, you get a pushback. And you're seeing this play out all over the world. So it's hard to know what is socially sustainable. When I was young, your age, I would have, you know, thought that progressive things are what are socially sustainable, that, you know, more egalitarian, more just, more, uh, these are the ones that are socially sustainable because they are happy, you know, they create better, happier societies. I don't know anymore. 
because the pushback can be intense and can actually create more divided and extreme societies and violent societies as well. So I think even the notion of what is socially sustainable, we need to unpack. And it's not the same in every country or in every society or every region. Environmentally sustainable also, I think we need to unpack. Often there are trade-offs that are not considered depending on the time horizon, okay? I mean, when fracking emerged, it was presented as an environmentally better option. I don't know if you guys remember, but that's how it was presented just maybe a decade ago as an environmentally better option. Then you, you get it and you realize, oh my God, it's making things worse. Similarly, biofuels is being presented as an environmentally better option. But we now know there are all kinds of other problems with biofuel production. So I think both of these we have to unpack much more before we can even talk about, I think there are internal contradictions and then of course there are contradictions within, between them. Thank you very much for those responses and for those reflections of the question, at least I'm sure for the audience, but definitely for me, I guess it's, it's kind of centered a lot of issues of power, politics, intersectional approaches, social ecology, which kind of really gives a view of what economics should be rather than a closed entity as a lot of economists tend to do. And I guess one major takeaway, at least for me from the entire thing is this entire thing of humbling, you know, economists down because the world out there is so complex. And so, yeah, I guess I would, with on that thought, before we move to the next segment, if there are any new questions that you would like to suggest, you may please, and uh, otherwise we'll move to the next segment. No, thank you. I think I already put more than I was supposed to on the plate. So I'm happy to have had this chance to interact. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thanks a lot, uh, Professor Ghosh. And now I would uh, request all the people who've been attending to come back to the constellation and help finalize the questions in editing the questions in the constellations. And now we're back to the studio. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jayadi, and thank you so much, Suobi. That was a really interesting talk. But remember, this is not the end of the session. This is actually the beginning of the question editing. Now we're going to use the, the questions that uh, Jayati suggested and also the questions that were brought to her and try to rephrase them to, before we upload them into the graph. So if you're somewhere else, if you're not already in the call with Nuolan, make your way into the development constellation where we're going to be discussing questions right now. I'm going to send it off to Nuolan. Thanks, Thomas. So it was a thrilling discussion with Jayade, and now we are moving further to rephrase, discuss, and explicitly elaborate on the questions we had. The idea of economic growth and determinants of its, its long-run process is a crucial problem to understand from a social point of view. If we will be able to pin down the causal network of economic development across countries, then the missing supporting conditions to establish a stable growth path could be introduced. Nevertheless, we need to keep it mind that growth is a contextual process confounded by thousands of local rules. This makes it quite difficult to establish universal propositions related to economic development across countries. And now we all have the potential to shape the economic perspectives that will determine the future of economic research. And here I will now start allowing uh, 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 phrasings of the questions we have already discussed. And please feel free to go to the constellation, you can already see it in, in the broadcast that you have the right to add new rephrasings to each question. By this, we will be able to pin down or improve those questions and then determine which rephrasing we want to choose. And while, this, uh, while we do this uh, discussion or the question rephrasing, Feel free to join our discussion by unmuting your mic and elaborating on how you would like to see the question that we have already discussed. Maybe we can start one by one and so, and then go on. The first question that was discussed by uh, J uh, Jayari, I, I can give it a, a highlight and then you can see 
that how can we build a model of development that encompasses the role of sociocultural diversity, which is often ignored by the current model of economic development. Is there anyone who would like to see this question differently? If so, please suggest a rephrasing for this question. After we will be done with each rephrasing and formulating of the questions, we will be able to pick our favorites out of the questions we have already worked through. And now the floor is yours. So I see not much response so far, which could be better. And yes, we've got already one rephrasing, which is you can already see. And if you if you uh, all can see, the second rephrasing suggestion is that how can we include social cultural diversity into economic models of development? If you think the second rephrasing or the, the way the, this person put the question is better than the first one, then please move your votes accordingly. So now you can either like it or move your likes to a new question. No, not new question, but the rephrasing of it. So I see the dynamics are changing. The new rephrase question gets already four likes and we will have one more minute to discuss this question and then move further to the other questions since we are uh, less in time. All right. Okay. Now the new rephrased question has already got the most likes. Now the new rephrased version is namely, how can we include sociocultural diversity into economic models of development? Or no, the dynamics change again, which is nice to see. Okay, now there is a tie almost. If we can get one or two more likes, we can further go on to the second question. All right, I don't see any response. Now I move to the second question. Um, this question was already uh, addressed and suggested by Jayadi, which namely that understanding an epistemological problem of economic growth related to GDP, that how to understand and quantify economic progress. As itself, the question is neatly there, but if you do think that there is a better way of formulating this, please add a rephrasing to the question just suggesting, just clicking on the button. We can have two more minutes on this and then move further. All right, I see no response. I can give last seconds and elaborate on this topic a bit more as well, that the mere epistemological problem of measuring what the economic progress itself resonates in reality. Okay, we got one already and I read it out loud. The first rephrasing is that, how should we define and quantify economic progress? This is already also a nice question. So, and please determine which of the two you like the most so that we can go on further.
Okay, we see some dynamics changing on the platform regarding how to understand and quantify economic progress. And if you can add some more likes, we can already make sure that we have at least one time rephrased version of the initial question we've got. This is an important question, an important question that may not only shape economics itself, but the reality in which it lives and to which it serves. Okay, now it's getting closer to a tie. Okay, it's a little bit away from a tie. Now we've got another rephrasing. How should we define, measure, and evaluate economic progress? Okay, the third one. Now it's getting more vibrant. Can economic progress be analyzed via numerical modeling is the new rephrasing. We've got now four competing phrasings for one relevant question. Now you, can, you have the right or you have the chance to determine which one is the winner. And I can give only max 30 more seconds and then we need to move on to the next question. Please make your choice. All right, 10 more seconds, and now we determine this question as well. All right, now there is a tie. This must be solved. Okay. All right. Now there's a tie again. The tie has been solved. Okay. Now we go on. The, the ref rephrasing that we have determined now is that how should we define and quantify economic progress? Thanks for your contribution. We move on. All right. The next one, it already got a rephrased, rephrasing suggestion. I have tried to highlight it. I, I think you can already see it. So, are there tensions between a socially sustainable and an environmentally sustainable development model? Is the same problem, uh, is the same problem to develop, uh, is the same problem applicable to developed and developing countries? I think there must be already one small minor change. The same problem. All right. Um, I read the suggested rephrasing for this question, which is what would be the key elements required to construct a socially, environmentally, and economically sustainable development model? What will have to be considered differently for developing and developed countries? And we've got already a new one. Welcome it. I read it out loud and please make your decision and your votes accordingly. Is a socially sustainable and environmentally sustainable development palace mutually exclusive? This is already talking in an exclusive di uh, diagram. We've got another one, welcome it. So I read it. How can we mediate between social and environmental sustainability with both developed and developing nations? Now we've got four competing rephrasings and this is a competition for public good uh, for a common good please make sure that you put your likes accordingly we can take one more minute because we've got two questions to decide upon as well all right the dynamics of this question are also changing we have the initial rephrasing is still the one that has received the most likes, which is four. All right. 
okay this was this will be a close win 30 more seconds and i move on to the next question i read out loud the question again okay now there is a tie uh, are there tensions between a socially sustainable and an environmentally sustainable development model is the same problem applicable to developed and developing countries and now the other one is read like this. How can we mediate between social and environmental sustainability within both developed and developing nations? And there is a tie which we must resolve. Please act to, to determine this. All right. I, in, if it's not further ado, we have the new rephrase version voted out loud. And how can we mediate between social and environmental sustainability with both, within both developed and developing nations is the rephrasing that we could formulate for the initial question. And moving to the ne next one, we have also one more suggestion or rephrasing for this. I have highlighted it, you can see it, and I read it out loud. Already the, the initial suggestion was voted out. The, the question reads as such, low car carbon, green and circular economy approaches suggest localization of production, of supply chains and of innovation. How can developing countries benefit from this approach if the West pushed for their fast integration into the world trade and global financial structures, which often run at the expense of local and endogenous development capabilities? I give you some seconds just to think about it and now we have one new rephrasing feel free to add more and i read it out loud how can localization of local production and supply chains work in developing countries which were often forced to liberal world trade and therefore have less strong local policy ca capacities some minor changes could have been made to this, but the choice is up to you. After this, we have anyways, one more question only to, to elaborate, so we can take a little bit longer and then go through the questions. Feel free to add a new rephrasing if you have so. I'll revise the new version. Got the most likes already. Okay. All right, the ship is moving further. Now we have determined this. With no further time consumption, we get it. The, the, the version of this question that we have settled down is how can look at, oh, okay, okay. We get a new rephrasing. I, I think we should give it a choice or chance. Oh, okay, we get two more. We definitely give it a go. All right, people, now I read two new rephrasings out loud. Firstly, does the Western imposition of free trade harm not only developing nations economically, but also sustainably more generally? This, okay, this is a good one. If we move on, the next rephrasing of the same question is as such. How can the localization of production and supply chains be established and mediated, maintained in developing countries that are often forced to adopt liberal trade policies at the expense of local markets. This is also an interesting rephrasing. So we, we see the dynamics are changing and the new rephrase 
version got the most question got the most likes out of all and this is the energy we would like to see okay now there is a competition going on yes people let's determine some of the pertinent questions that will be taken out of YSI plenary. The floor is yours. And you have the all power to do so. Okay, we get a new rephrasing. I read it out loud and then we take one more minute and then move to the next question. How does global liberal trade policies restrict local policy options? I would say that this rephrasing already um, misses some issues that were mentioned in the initial formulation, formulated version of the question. So that is why we, we rather need to need to determine the question alongside the initial question itself. So so the rephrased question should resonate the initial question the best, let's say. Okay, we get somewhat a tie again. I give 15 more seconds and then we will move on to the next question. Okay, now there's a tie again. I read out loud. Okay, I can't make a decision here. So the, the question that got now, at least the most question is how can the localization of production supply chains be established and maintained in developing countries that are often forced to adopt liberal trade policies at the expense of local markets. Now we move on to the last question that JRT addressed, which was suggested by you, the audience, was namely that is mesoeconomics an alternative approach to incorporate power imbalances and structural inequalities in economic theory? In itself, mesoeconomics, like the one that I know from an evolutionary um, economics um, ontology, is that like mesoeconomics is really less research topic within economics. So I think it's it's a good goal. And we have also one suggested rephrasing for this question, and I read it out loud. How to move away from macro versus micro debate towards multi-level alternatives that would consider power and structural imbalances in economic theory. This is also a good uh, formulation because the problem usually is the, the way the economists reduce the reality or try to see everything in terms of non-emergent properties because the, the issue from an evolution dynamics is that there is some emergent properties that 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 get developed out of also all, all sorts of things from non-intelligent to intelligent agents and you can now make your choice we can we, you can have one more minute and suggest a new rephrasing if you wish so as well All right, now there is a tie. So we have 20 more seconds to make a decision on this question. And then we will move on to re review the questions again in case there is more suggestions after we've already went through all the questions of the platform. But before that, we need to solve this tie. So please make sure that you now cast a vote or just to cast your like to determine the best rephrasing of this question. After that, we will go on. I see no reaction. <laughs> More reaction, please.
Okay, now we have it determined. I move on. And so the question that we determine is, is mesoeconomics an alternative to incorporate power imbalances and structural inequalities in economics theory? All right. With no further ado, I think it's the best if we move on to determine our favorites. Now, no more likes will be allowed. So make sure that you go on and check if your likes are correct and if, if it is your last choice to make. And after that, I will allow you to put favorites and these favorites add in to make the, the star larger and larger. And the, the question that receives the most favorites out of all the questions that on the on the YSR platform will go to the 100 questions that we will select from the YSI. So this is a proper democratic function in which the cast, casted vote, votes or favorites of people will determine our future questions. So in 10 seconds, I already changed the dynamics. No new phrasings are already allowed and likes are taken as well. Now you can see the favorites button with this star next to the question on the left-hand side. And now please make sure that you add your favorites uh, this stars next to the questions and and in total you are given 10 rights for the whole plenary to 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 cast a favorite vote and that's why be be, be careful scroll down the entire question list and make sure that you okay i've got the information that we have two more minutes to 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 determine the favorite questions or the most pertinent questions for economists in the upcoming decades to come. And by the way, you will always have the chance to change your favorites later on by going to your account and seeing on the constellation which questions you have voted as your favorites. So that will also be important for us to see which questions of the plenary are determined for future. Yes, Adam, you're right. The, the question with the most stars so far is the one that Jayati herself proposed, namely, how can economics address the issues of intersecting inequalities? Class, gender, race, caste, ethnicity, local uh, or migrant backgrounds, which already got six stars. All right, all right, I guess we are slowly approaching the, to the end of this session, which was a lively one, with all your participation. You still have some chance to add your favorites until we finish this talk now. Thanks for all. Thanks for making it here. Thanks for being involved and making a difference. This difference will determine the future of economics, even though it's a small and really incremental one. We believe that this will make a larger impact on future economists to come by inspiring them the vision we had throughout these question fairs. Thanks for making it. And now the law favorites are taken out. And that is all about it. We are now heading over back to the lighthouse.
Actually, you know, and we're not in the lighthouse. We are out here to look at the entire questions graph as it looks. A second ago, we were over here in the development constellation. These questions that you can see are the questions that Nuolan and all of you on the questions call just discussed, and we can see how it's uh, getting into the graph. You'll also see that some of the stars up here are really big now. That's because a lot of people have been over there in the development constellation and favorited some of those questions, saying those are the, those are the questions that I want to work on. Those are my research questions, and those are the questions that I find pertinent. And every time someone go in and do that, the, the, uh, the stars will grow in size. So uh, the development constellation is obviously one of the most popular ones. But now that we've had a session, I think this was actually one of the best floating tests, like sm very smooth that we've had so far. As you know, it's a new system. We're trying it out for the very first time as this plenary, and I feel we're really getting the hang of it now. But let's have a look inside the development constellation to see the status in there. And now you can see this is the same thing you will go see if you go to ysiplenary.org and click into the development constellation. The lines between the stars are the stars that are on the list of the 100 most favorite questions so far. You can see the big ones like this one down here and this one over here. Those are like really upvoted questions. Uh, so far, it doesn't take many votes to get to the top of the list as we move closer to Sunday. Favorites, there's going to be more favorites, but at this point, we're making the top of the list over here with six. The, the most favorite question in the development constellation is still this question, is industrialization a necessary step for economic development? I think it's actually right now the most favorite question in the entire graph. Uh, together with a question by Jayadi Ghosh that we just heard. So this is from the, from the uh, session that we were just participating in. How can economics address issues of uh, uh, intersecting inequalities such as class, gender, race, caste, ethnicity, local migrant, and so on? These are some of the most favorite questions we have in the entire graph. Uh, and they're coming from this session we just saw. If you think that there's other questions that should be favorited, now is the time to go into the graph, mark the questions you like, and as you can see, it doesn't take a lot of favorite yet to get your uh, voice heard. So make it over into the graph, place your favorites. Here you can see how it looks in the development constellation, and, and back here you can see that there's a lot of small stars that could use your favorites at this point. Now, it's only going to be approximately 10 minutes before we're back with some very exciting announcements. We're going to hear a little short update from the Cooperatives Working Group. And on top of that, two very prominent people have been submitting questions that will go right into the graph. This includes George Soros, and it includes the Pope. So tune back in 10 minutes. This is going to be really exciting. <laughs>